So friends, I wanted to know, when is the last time you paused and you said, wow, now that's incredible. Have you ever done it when it comes to nature? I don't know how many of you are watching the storms this past week and maybe looked at a storm and the lightning in the sky or the tornadoes that we had and we said, wow, that's incredible. Or maybe you took a vacation somewhere and you were over the ocean or you were looking up a mountain and you're like, wow, that's incredible. We had a moment like that this year. So the bloomers went to Vegas to Sin City to share the gospel. I'm just kidding. We were on vacation. Um, and uh, we had a chance to go to the Red Rock Canyon. And uh, while we were there, I'll show you a picture of it. Um, it was one of those moments where we knew a picture wouldn't do it justice. And we drove into this place and we're like, wow, this is incredible. And the reason I bring this moment up, the reason I, I talk about these moments is because I, I, I believe that God's thumbprint on your life is for you to do this about something or someone. That if you're taking notes today, here's one of the things I believe. God created us with a sense of wonder. And so if yours is not nature, for my Sox fans watching the Field of Dreams, uh, maybe your wow was Tim Anderson in the ninth. The walk-off against the Yankees. If you're not a sports person, maybe yours is about a child and, and you look at the children God gave you and, and what they're doing or how they look or the words that they say and you're just like, wow, these things, they're just, wow. Or for you, maybe it is a musician or an actor. We were all created to go, wow, about something. And whatever that is for you, those wow-worthy items, are also the things that we might be apt to worship. Now, when it comes to worship, worship is simply giving your time, devotion, and energy towards something. And what this means, if you wow over your kids, you're probably giving them your time, your energy, maybe some of your money. Um, uh, they are, are part of your realm. If you're a nature person, you might have gotten out and you're like, wow, we, we got to spend some time out on the lake. We got to go see the mountains because that's our wow-worthy thing. That is what we gather to worship. But as we gather in this place, I guess I wanted to wonder, what is really worthy of worship? What's really worthy of our time and attention, our energy, our emotion? What is truly worthy? And because in this place we hear the voice of God through his word, I wanted to share a scripture with you where a man named Paul says, really there are two options of things you can worship. Are you ready for it? So here are your two options of things you can worship. Paul says in Romans, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Did you see the two options? You're built to go wow. You're, you're built to worship. We all are worshipers, but you have two choices. You can either worship a created thing, or you can worship the creator. And something I believe is that while we enjoy created things, it is the creator that's worthy of all praise. It's the God behind our kids. It's the God behind nature. It's the God behind all things that deserves our wow and wonder. Let's talk about this. I, I wonder how many of you are Marvel fans. So maybe you saw Black Widow or Spider-Man or the Avengers, and you think of all of these characters, and I don't know where you align. But to love Marvel is really to love this guy, Stan Lee. Without Stan Lee's imagination, you would have no Spider-Man. You would have no Black Widow. So you've got to tip your hat to Stan Lee at some point. Uh, same if you're into Harry Potter. I don't know if you're Hufflepuff or Sl Slytherin. Um, but regardless, you got to tip your hat to J.K. Rowling, right? Uh, without her, there would be no allegiance. And so with our God, yes, you might pick out something that made you say, wow, but my, my goal in these moments is that you would start connecting the dots, that that, that is evidence of a wow-worthy God. He's the one who brought that good thing. He is the giver of all good things. And so as we dive into God's word, today we're going to find Moses and the whole Israelite nation pausing and saying, wow, God, 
you're incredible. And I bet they they probably would have told us, you know, a a picture doesn't do it justice for what we just saw. And even reading about it doesn't do justice because what we just saw was amazing. Here's the context. God had just brought his people out of Egypt with the ten plagues. And they were wow worthy. But if that wasn't enough, Pharaoh mounted, mounted his army to go after them. And God led his people through the Red Sea on dry land. And then afterwards, he closed the sea on Pharaoh and the whole Egyptian army. This this massive offense against the Israelites, he just completely decimated because he is that powerful. And they had just witnessed that. And what we have today is Moses' song about what God had done song about the the majesty, the splendor, the strength of who God is. Now before we get into it, just a a reminder of the series of this, the premise of this series. We are starting a, a new series called Big Church, and really the reason is because as a church we have the opportunity in this season to put our big boy pants on, uh, to grow up once again in the church. And we're going to talk about five things that we want to have uh, as far as intentional focuses going forward. And one of them is worship. That we had without the opportunity to lose ourselves in the wonder of praise towards God. So let's see a man who did this, uh, Moses. Um, I'm going to invite you to stand as we hear the reading of the word of God. Here is the song. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. I love translating that. It really just said, God is the man of war. <laughs> just, that was cool. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword, my hand will destroy them. But you blew them with your breath, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. This is part of the song that Moses wrote. Um, Before you sit down, could you say out louder to someone next to you, there's no one like our God. There's no one like our God. Please be seated. Uh, Raise a hand if you're able to go on vacation this summer. Um, break away. It could be a weekend, a day. Um, you were... I want to talk a little bit about the problem I have with vacation. Um, and it's that regardless of when you went, it could be a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, it always seems way far away, further away than when it actually happened. And can anyone relate to this? Because here's what happened. You go and, and you might spend a week, you might spend a weekend, and then it only takes like one day back in real life And you get that message, you get that assignment, you have that traffic, and you then forget of the the joy and the splendor of where you just were. (laughs) That vacation, no matter how long or, or when it happened, it can seem so far away because that's just the way that life works. And as people, we're accustomed to forgetting the good because of some of the struggle that goes on. That's not just true about vacation. This is also true about relationships. I don't know if you ever noticed that you can have a relationship where you have so much good. You stack it up, so many good experiences, but then one bad comes, and that's what you remember. 
That one bad sticks with you and you have a hard time remembering even the nice comments, even the good times, all of that. And this is the problem we have as a people. I bring this up because what happens with vacation and people is also what's going on spiritually. See, we have a faithful God. A God who never takes a day off, who is always good all the time. But as we wake up, as we live our lives, we forget his faithfulness because of a current struggle. We hear of forgiveness on a regular basis, but so often we wake up and we're filled with guilt and shame. We've heard he is the king of kings and we just sang about it. But we again get so concerned about the kingdoms of this world that it clouds out all the good of God. And so one of the things we do in worship, and one of the reasons it's good to gather in worship, because it's in these moments, if you're taking notes, that you're going to be able to call to mind and remember God's goodness. Just as a vacation might recalibrate you to the goodness of this earth, so worship is intended to recalibrate you to the goodness of God and His control. And as Moses sings his song, all Moses is simply doing is remembering what God had just done. Consider some of these words. He said, The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My Father is God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army is hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned into the Red Sea. Now, I was geeking out a little bit about the Hebrew. Um, in Hebrew poetry, they don't try to rhyme things. Uh, they try to use what's called parallelism, where they stack up the same thoughts and give nuance and reflections. So he talked about Pharaoh a couple times and basically just said, Pharaoh's defeated in so many words. But where is his focus? It's not on the problems, and there were a lot. Right now, the Israelites don't have a home, they don't have food, and they don't have training for war, and that's what they're going to face. What he's bringing to mind is God's faithfulness. So as a community, our intention is to create these moments of worship with messaging and meditation and music that lead you into remembering God's goodness because here's what we know about life. You're going to have a week where the strains of life get you down. You're going to have relationships that fall apart. You're going to have moments where you feel depressed and anxious, filled with guilt and shame. And when you come here, here's what I'm going to remind you. God has overcome. That any sin you think of, he has forgiven through the blood that he shed. That anything that feels against you, he has power over. He has power over financial strain. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. He has power over the kingdoms of this world as he makes uh, nations rise and fall at his command. He has power over whatever is going on. Relational strain, he is the strength of our heart and our portion forever. And so it's good that we continue to gather and worship and recalibrate our hearts. And what we do is simply remember the goodness of God. Now, Martin Luther, he had a comment on how we should live and how it would affect our worship. He had this to say. He said, what if we lived as if Christ died yesterday, rose this morning, and was coming back tomorrow? If you lived in the wake of that, how would that recalibrate you? If you just saw yesterday all your sins paid for, if today you know he was victorious, and if tomorrow he was coming back, how that would recalibrate you. And worship does that for us. As it reminds us of the cross, gives us the victory of Easter, and it prepares us for Christ's return. But the problem is that we're so easily distracted as well. I don't know if you saw the movie Up, and there's this dog who, whenever a squirrel comes, it breaks up his and squirrel. And I don't know if you uh, relate to that on any level, um, but I think that's going on a lot when it comes to our focus on who God is. 
In fact, to talk about this a little bit, um, I know Zoom is not going away, and I want to tell you about a new feature that Zoom has. Zoom has something called focus mode. And the reason this is important is because if you've been on this big Zoom, I'll never forget my, my wife did it with preschoolers. Uh, she had like 50 preschoolers, Lord bless her, on a Zoom. And, and there was one preschooler who just kept saying hi to Nico. That's all I heard from the other room was, hi, Nico, hi, Nico. Um, if you've ever been distracted by Zoom, there's now a focus mode um, where you can basically just turn it on so they see you and them. That's, that's all they see, right? They can't talk. That's, we're going to focus in on what we're doing. I bring this up because I wonder, we need like a worship focus mode, right? Don't we? And yes, I mean in these moments because sometimes we're distracted. Like, does anyone else hear a cricket? Um, <laughs> well, sometimes uh, we're distracted, you know, um, by, by, by this or that going on, those around us. So not only do we need a worship focus mode to keep us in it, but also in our lives, how do we keep the focus and attention on God? How does that continue to happen? In fact, to, to take this further, I wonder, what is the thing that distracts you most from looking at God? I'm just curious. As you analyze the whole of your life, what is that thing that interrupts your purview of him above all things? Now, I think the answers might vary. It might be, you know, I have work or I have kids or I have, you know, this or that. We're always like, squirrel. And so the psalmist, he says, this is how we should live. The psalmist said, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. The goal of a believer is how do we take a magnifying glass to our God so that out of all that's going on, we see him over all. Because if we see him over all, we have a God who's working out everything for our good. If we see him over all, we see his unfailing love regardless of how the people of the world are acting. If we see him over all, we see him Lord of the church and we have confidence. But that is the goal. To continue to make much of the Lord so he's the biggest thing we're focusing on. We're going to help you to do that amazing love. But to go on, you know, um, th there's more we can talk about when it comes to worship. And something that I consider is that Worship, I think, is highly personal. How we prefer to worship is based a lot on preference. And to get you to believe that, I wanted to ask, what is your favorite worship song? In fact, if you're on the chat box and you want to write in, what is your favorite worship song? I'd just love to know. Um, and, and so as you're thinking about that, I want to tell you about the, the work of one man, uh, missionary Terry Schultz. So we have a guy working in the Chicago area, just a fantastic man. Uh, who was a missionary for a long time in Lima, Peru. And his current uh, roles and responsibilities is to go to uh, Christians throughout the world and make sure they can worship in a style that is authentic to their language, that is authentic to their preference, that is authentic to their music. And, and so he's going into places like Africa, and instead of having them sing like Germans with four-part harmony... He's trying to deduce how, how do Africans sing and, and what is their preference, what is their language, what is their style. And I think it's beautiful work to do. It's beautiful because what I recognize when it comes to what is your favorite worship song, the answers are different, right? That, that yours is going to be different than mine and the style might be different. What, what I recognize in, in preference of worship, that, that some prefer it loud and some prefer it soft. Some prefer with their hands raised in the air. Some prefer them folded because that's what you do. Uh, some prefer heads down, some up. There are all these preferences in worship. And so we have a chance to analyze a song today. And this is Moses' song, and we don't know its title and we don't know its melody, but this is what some commentators think is the refrain. The refrain is here, sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. And I was thinking of a title like maybe we could call he is exalted or victorious God or I don't know, uh, take your pick. And I wonder like what would the, the sound have been like? What was the melody line? Were they using any instruments? And some of you even looking at the lyrics like, ah, I'm not sure that's my favorite song. 
right? Can we be honest? Like the horse and the hurling, I'm not sure. It's true, but I like the, you know, other psalms better. And I want to tell you, that's okay. It's okay if it's not your favorite song, because it's just a song with a style. And what I'm trying to get to is this point. When it comes to worship, it is not about the song that you sing, but the heart that you bring. See, you can sing in many different styles with many different lyrics. And the goal in Christian worship is that it will be about God. It should be true to His Word. It should remind you of His splendor. That, that, that's a good song. But in general, it can be very different. What, what matters is your heart. Because... Have you ever been in worship where you're going through the motions but you didn't know the meaning? You ever struggled so much with a melody line that you didn't even have time to focus on what the words were saying? You ever wondered what was going on, like why are we doing what and what's the meaning behind all of that? If that's ever been the experience, man, you can have the most biblical words over a song in in a style that you think is the most God-appropriate, but if you don't understand what it's saying, it's not effective. The word doesn't work through osmosis. It has to be understood. What matters is that we bring our hearts and know what is going on. In fact, the prophet Isaiah warned us about motion without meaning, and, and this is what he said. He said, these people, they come near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips. They're going through the motions, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is merely human rules they have been taught. The goal going forward, regardless of your preference, that every time we gather, you're going to say, God, you got my heart today. (laughs) I'm going to make sure whatever the song, whatever the preacher, I'm going to try to see you because you're awesome. I'm going to fight for that. I'm going to make sure just as I show up in so many different arenas and I give my A game, that I'm going to give my best when I come to this place. Because I need you, Lord. Because there's nothing like you, Lord. Because you stand above all things, Lord. That's the goal of worship done well. You know, when it comes to music, one of my favorite bands is a band called Hillsong. Have we heard of them? And I'll never forget, I had a chance to listen to them and their approach to worship uh, before they gave a concert. And what was really interesting is that they have no main lead singer. Do you know that about Hillsong? They have a lot of different singers. Actually, they have a lot of different bands that make up the Hillsong movement. As they look at what they try to do, they try to honor every musician but appropriate their talents. And so if someone's better on, on this leading or someone's better at harmony, if someone's better at keys or whatever, it doesn't matter. They're all the same movement. It's not about one person overall. I thought that was such a great approach. I bring that up because there is some debate whether Moses actually wrote this song. Do you know that? Um, so I was reading some commentary, and, and they say, well, Moses, he wrote a lot of scripture, and he never writes this way. Like, it's too poetic. And so some commentators say, well, he was, you know, really awestruck, and so Moses could have put this together in his finer moments. But some say it could have been Miriam. The language is so different that maybe this is Miriam's song. And I had to laugh at the editors of Scripture because they split the difference. When it comes to the heading of Exodus 15, they don't accredit anyone. They just say, let's, let's call it both. I bring that up because does it matter if it's Moses or Miriam's song? It doesn't. What matters is that it talks about who God is and what he did. And that also is so essential when it comes to worship. That when it comes to our principles, worship is not about the leader, but about being led to God. And that's so important in this current Christian context. We live in a Christian context with rock star pastors and rock star musicians. And while we can praise that God is using someone in a good way, that praise should never be for that person alone. 
In fact, Paul, uh, he talked about it. Uh, there was a, a time where one of his congregations was kind of split over who was leading worship. Some said, well, I like Apollos. And some said, well, I like Peter or Cephas. And some said, well, I follow Paul. And so Paul, he had to speak directly into this dynamic. And, and, and he said this. He said, you know, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? They're only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each his task. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. At Amazing Love, I'm so excited in this season that you get to hear another voice with his own language telling you about that same God. Next week, we have the opportunity to hear from Pastor Jeff as he brings a powerful word, and I'm uh, so excited to hear from a brother about that same God and, um, and know that God is going to use him powerfully in this place because worship is not about a leader. It's about being led to that same God. One final thing. As I consider how COVID changed us, I consider how tempting a thought it would be to say, you know what, because everything's online, I don't really have to gather as a community. In fact, because everything's online, maybe I don't even need to belong to a church. I've been thinking about that a lot as a pastor, if that's a healthy thing. Now, one of the things I know is that if, for safety reasons, you're there, and, and that's what, again, is, is protecting you because you're at risk, I, I totally get it. We love live stream. Um, I also love when, when you're away on vacation, you can't make it, and it has a chance to, to bring you into community. But, but if the only goal is to stay alone, say, I'm going to follow Jesus alone. That's, that's my spiritual game plan going forward. I just don't think it's best. I mean, consider it this way. Have you ever had a moment in life where you wanted to share it with someone else? Maybe you're looking at a sunset and, and you were away at work and you're like, man, if my significant other was here, then it'd be good. Maybe you're eating a meal and you know that foodie in your family and, and, and you can't help but think, man, if, if that foodie was here, they would sure enjoy this. I mean, in fact, we got to come back. We, they got to be here. Because some things, they're just better together. I think of the song that was sung this day. Moses, he could have just went to his tent if he was the writer, and he could have had this moment with God, and that would have been an incredibly powerful thing for him. But more powerful is a whole community erupting over this same song and this same sentiment. More powerful is not only Moses, but the whole nation saying together, And that's what I've seen in the eyes of people who have come back to worship with tears in their eyes, and I knew they missed it. Because, yes, it's something to worship alone, but but honestly, the wonder of worship happens best when it's in community. And so as a community, we're going to continue to create these moments where we say, wow, God, you're incredible. Because as a community, what we know is there is one who's worthy of all praise. And that is the Lord we've come to see. Amen.